Hello, ladies and gents. We are taking a look at continuing with Unit G on graph types, and we're going to start here on page G15. So this particular part is actually something that I could just simply assign to you to read because it, it's pretty easy reading, but I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. And then I'm going to stop and talk about stem and leaf graphs and give you an example of that. And then we'll talk about histograms in the next one. So let's take a look at what we've got here. So once you've constructed tables then, then the next thing that you may want to do then is to describe the data using a graph, or if you're in Excel, to call it a chart. And so one way that you could do that is with a pictogram. Now we saw pictograms before back in unit I when we were talking about how we can use graphs to deceive people uh, and whether that is intentional or not is it is a problem when you're dealing with this kind of thing. So you remember the the oil example that we were talking about here, barrels of oil? It's the same kind of animal here. So in this particular one here we're talking about the number of dwellings in select Red Deer neighborhoods. This is going back to the 2016 census. And in our particular case, we're only interested in the height of the building here or the, the little house here. So you can see that they, they all have a baseline here. They all start at the same point, but the West Park ones are about twice as high as the South Hill West ones. And so that's all that we're looking at. The problem that we have, of course, is that a pictogram is really a two-dimensional representation of a 3D object, and we're only interested in measuring one dimension. And so that's the problem that we tend to have. And that's why when you take a look at these houses, you'd think that, well, you know, I could probably put about six of those South Hill West houses inside of the West Park West Lake ones, and yet we're really only, only interested in the measuring the height. A better way of handling that is like this. So in this particular case then you've got every house here then represents 300 units. That's shown down here. And so you can see that it's a lot easier then to to not get fooled by the actual size of the house in terms of, of not just its height but also in terms of its its width and perceived depth as well. So this is a better way of doing this. Now this is really no different from what we've got below called the bar graph of attributes. The only difference is that you're using a, a nice picture there which is kind of handy but a bar graph of attributes does exactly the same thing. The important thing to note here is that when we're talking about just a straight bar graph of attributes as opposed to a histogram which we'll look at later in a bar graph of attributes, typically what you have here then in the x-axis, or of course if you turned it on its side, I mean it would be the y-axis, right? So this I think in Excel they call the, this a bar graph, and then this one would be called a column graph. Um, it doesn't really matter it's just which way that you display it. So in this particular column graph then, what we have here is these are nominal classifications and the same up here. These are nominal classifications. And so that's typical then of the bar graph where the the y-axis in this particular case, the other axis, shows you then the, the number of units or in this case the population of major Alberta cities. So that's a bar graph of attributes and you can see how you can compare years in this particular case by having bars beside each other and so on. So you've seen lots of examples of that over the years. A stacked bar graph is really useful when your, your goal is to show the various components that together make up the height of the bar graph. So if I'm interested, for instance, in the not just the total number of people in, say, a business admin 111, which is an intro stats course, compared to business 306 course, but I'm also interested in the breakdown here of gender with females and males. Uh, again, we could have some, some others or people who did not um, 
preferred not to answer, but uh, we don't have any actually in this particular group here. But we would want to, to note those as well. So this is showing you then that the total number of people who took business at Min 111 is somewhere around a, a little more than 150. And you can see how it's broken down into 61 males and 94 females. So I guess, I guess when you add those together, it's 155. And then you can compare that to 306. So that's a great way of showing how you would break down the various components. By the way, we will be looking at pie graphs later. And, and if you're just interested in focusing on one of these, probably a pie graph is, is the better way to go. But if you're taking a look at comparing two different bars here, then this is a great way of doing it. Now, a percentage stack bar graph is a similar kind of thing here, but this is where you notice that the heights of the ones up here are, are different, right? This one goes up to 155, and this one goes up to 62. If you're interested in just a straight percentage breakdown, then a percentage stack bar graph or column graph in Excel is the way to go in this. And so this is really good for these kind of questions, which are the ones where we use a, a Likert scale, L-I-K-E-R-T. It's actually the guy's name was Likert, but uh, most people pronounce this a Likert scale. And so that's where you've got a rating scale here of very dissatisfied, dissatisfied, satisfied, very satisfied. You might have a neutral category in here, but you're looking at the what percentage of the whole here is is very dissatisfied versus dissatisfied and so on like that. So it's a nice way of looking at that. The reason why we look at it as a percentage stack bar graph is you might find that you, you've got a greater number of, of people, let's say more in the 31 to 50, than you do in the, the other two categories. And so it's, so you have bars of, of different heights if you go back to this one right up here. Whereas this way you can see the percentage breakdown of each and so it's easier to compare them. So that's a percentage stacked bar graph or column graph. Pie graphs is, as I mentioned before, if you're just interested in really focusing on just one of the bars in the above example, then this is probably the way to do this is a pie graph. Now, I showed this as a three-dimensional pie graph, and I know when we talked about this in Unit I, I said it's probably cleaner just to show it as a 2D pie graph, so it's uh, something that I need to kind of eat my words on that a little bit there. Again, if you want to focus in on one particular part, like say the university transfer programs or something, as compared to the others, then you could pull that out, that one piece. And that's called uh, exploding the, the, the pie. And just pulling out the one piece, exploding the one piece to pull it away from the rest. That's something that you can do. But everybody's seen pie graphs before. Of course, when you add up the percentages, they all come to 100%. You can also put in the actual raw scores there if you want. A dot plot is very useful when you're just taking a look at at taking a, a look at a bunch of numbers and how they are spread out. Now, these are the ages of the 50 people, which we actually were looking at back at the beginning of Unit G. And it's interesting on this one here is that you, you may not have noticed it when you took a look at the data back in Unit G here. And uh, in fact, let me just go quickly and find those. That would be there, right there, that data right there. And if you take a look at that, you, it doesn't really show you that there are some outliers. In this particular case, we've got some lower values, which are outliers. And it's not immediately obvious here. You can see, actually, these guys who, who really are outliers here. You see how much lower those are compared to the rest here? And so a dot plot is a good way to show the spread of the data and where it tends to clump and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk about stem and lead leaves now, and that's actually probably the most 
difficult of the type of graphs that we'll be looking at here. So let's take a look at this one here. I'm going to create something called a stem and leaf. I actually got the computer to make one for me. I was using a program called Minitab, and so Excel doesn't have this particular one here. But I want to show you how to actually make this thing here. So these are the ages of the 50 people right up here. We've seen this, these data before. And we want to put them into something called a stem and leaf, which is right in here. Now, I've got three questions down here, and that is, what do each of the, the different columns represent? So we've got a left column, a right column, and then a middle column here. So the, the middle column are just simply the, the tens. So you can see um, we got tens, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and so on like that up the, to nineties. And you can see them here. So they're the first digit of the number. So that's an easy thing to, to see here. The right column actually shows the leaves. And so the, the nice thing about a stem and leaf is that you, you can see really the distribution of the numbers. You can see this kind of nice, it's almost like a bell shape, but it's, it's a little bit uh, what we'll call later in unit C, it's skewed downwards. And we saw that in the dot plot here. You can see that the, you've got these lower numbers here. They tend to pull the average down, we'll see in unit C. Okay, so you can see that skewness. And again, uh, we'll be introduced to that term later. But it also shows the, the actual numbers themselves. So, for instance, uh, if you take a 10 and add a 4, you get 14. And then you've got a 21. And then you've got a 32. And then you've got 249. So this is how you write it. 4 and then 99. 9. And then you've got a bunch of 50s. So if you take a look at the 50s, the leaves here are 3, 4, 4, 5, 7, 7, and 7. And you can see them all right there. So you see how this thing works? So that's uh, the middle column. That is the right-hand leaves, which is really nice because you can actually see every number in the data set. But what about this left-hand side here? Let me just change colors here. I'm going to go to maybe a nice blue. So what about this column right here. Well, let me show you how you do this. Is we're going to go back basically to, and I'll show you this in a moment, we'll go back to uh, earlier in unit G where we talked about the table, right? Where we made the table of frequencies. Now, one thing to note is that there's actually a frequency of zero here for the, for the class zero to nine. And this actually starts, the computer would not pick up that there, we should have a, um, a, a class with, from 0 to 9 here. So the first number is 14, so it put it in the first class. So we're just going to ignore that. And then we've got um, a frequency of 1, 114, a 21, a 32, 249s, there's 750s. There's 1060s, there's 1270s, there's 1080s, and there's 690s, and that sums up to 50. Now, what we did in the um, earlier in the in the unit here then is we came up with the the less than cumulative frequencies. So I'm just showing those as a, a CF with a downward arrow, meaning that we're going to add up the frequencies as we go down this column here. And then this is the more than cumulative frequencies, where we, we actually start at the bottom and then add up. So let's add these together here. We're going to have 1 plus 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, plus 2 is 5, 12, 22, 34, 44, and 50. And then going up this way, we're going to start at the bottom here, which is the 6, and then add in a 10, which is 16, plus 12. So we're going up this F column now. And uh, so we got 28, 38, plus 7 is 45, 47, 48, 49, 
and 50. And of course, if we had our class of 0, we would have, we'd have a 0 here, and we'd have a 50 here. Now, where have we seen those guys before? There we go. Okay. So this is what we've, we've just taken a look at here. We had our frequency column, the absolute frequencies, and then the less than cumulative frequencies, and then the more than cumulative frequencies. So we've taken a look at that. Okay, that was page 29, so let's now go back. There we go. Okay, so before we fill in this, take a look at this column right here, what we need to do is to take a look at this particular guy here. And so I've got this 12, which is in brackets, and the question is, what's special about that particular class? that particular groupings, the 70s. Well, you might think that it is because it's the biggest class, that it has a frequency actually of 12, which is the highest frequency. And you wouldn't be far off, but that's actually not the reason why this is special in a stem and leaf. The reason why this is bracketed and set aside from the others is that this is the what we call the median class. Now, again, we're going to learn about the median in the next unit, which is unit C. But the median is, what we'll learn, is the median is equal to the value of rank n plus 1 divided by 2. So we've got 50 values plus 1 divided by 25 and a half value. So I'm going to change colors again. Let's take a look at the cumulative frequencies as we go down here. We got 1, plus another one is 2, plus another one is 3, 5, 12, 22. By the time we get to the end of the 70s, we're up to 34 values. So that 25 and a half value falls somewhere in this 70 class here. If we were to use the more than cumulative frequencies going this way, same idea here is we've got 6 plus 16 plus another word 12 makes it 28. And so again, we've passed over the 25 and a half value. So the median class then, the class that contains the middle number, the number that has half of the values below it and half of the values above it, is in the 70s class. And in fact, if, if you take a look, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going a little further here. So what we do then is we take the less than cumulative frequencies up to the median class, the greater than cumulative frequencies below the median class, and the frequency of the median class. And you can see all those numbers there. Here's the less than cumulative frequencies up to, up to the 70s. And then here's the more than cumulative frequencies after the 70s, so the 80s and 90s. And then here's the median class, the frequency of the median class, which is 12. If you wanted to find the median, you could go, and we got 1, 2, 3, 5, 12, 22. So we've got 22 to the end of the 60s. We're looking for the 25 and a half values. So it would be 23, 24, 25 and a half. It would be right in here, halfway between the two 74s, two of the three 74s. And so your median then would end up being 74. So that is the left-hand column. And that's how we do a stem and leaf. I've got another little video that you can take a look at that shows you how to handle a stem and leaf when the classes aren't in the in tens. They're actually a width of eight. And I'd like you to take a look at that one. I do have just a little bit left on this particular um, video. And that is scatter, scatter plot graphs. And so that's where you have not just a horizontal axis, the x-axis, which is interval in nature, so, such as the area of a house in square feet, but you've also got a y-axis, which is interval in nature, and in this particular case, then, is the house prices. 
And so every one of these dots here then represents an actual house. So this particular house then is about uh, just over 180 square feet, square meters, pardon me. And then you can come up with a price for that house, which is maybe $270,000 or so. What you can do, and we will do in our 307 course, if you continue on, is to actually come up with the line of best fit, and that's something called the regression line. And we will talk about that then in Business 307. Last one here is a line graph can be used when both the X and Y are interval in scale, and the X axis represents usually something like time or some ordered variable and so the line graph then shows the variable changes over time. So this works well when you're talking about temperatures. You can see that this is something down here which is, is ordered January up to December. Um, not exactly interval in terms of the number of days, but certainly close enough. But it's certainly a, an ordered variable. And then uh, the degree Celsius, of course, is, is an interval scale here. What doesn't work is if you were to try to put a line graph back over here on a bar graph. Um, in fact, let's go down to this one here. It would be goofy to do this kind of thing, is to go like that, and then like that, and like that. That would seem to indicate that there's some sort of drop and then a leveling out. But but take a look at the scales. I mean, we've got Calgary, Edmonton, Lethbridge, Red Deer. It, could we have ordered those a different way? Yeah, I mean, we could have ordered them from north to south or something like that. And so it, it doesn't really matter which way you order it in this particular case then. And putting a line by connecting up the top points of each of the bars here is just goofy. It doesn't make any sense. There's, there's no meaning to it. But there is, back over here, when you're talking about either a regression line or this kind of thing like a temperature chart, and that's because of the ordered nature of this particular variable right here. All right, that brings us to the end of, of this. The next thing that I'm going to look at is histograms, and I will end the video here.